The table is a unique symbol and its meaning goes well beyond just a piece of furniture. It's a place where people share meals, gather to exchange ideas, to laugh, to cry, and to stop and rest. Similar to the tables we find in our homes, Christ's table, the table of grace, forgiveness, and mercy, was forged by his gospel. All are welcome at his table who have tasted and known the freedom in which the gospel brings. Jesus has provided a seat at the table for all who believe. No matter where you come from or where you are going, Come rest at Christ's table, where sinners and saints can come break bread with the King. The table in which our hope is found. The table where we are all equal. The table where we celebrate our identity in Christ. There is a seat open for you at the table. We uh, started at the table at the beginning of the fall where we walked line by line through the book of Ephesians. And I told you when I first came here as a pastor last year that, uh, that that's what we're gonna do. And now we do topical sermon series every once in a while, but we really have a heart for exegetical walking line by line through books of the Bible so that we can see the entirety of what God is telling us. And, and now I'm a liar because we're not doing that. We're not gonna actually finish Ephesians until 2017. So there you go, you're welcome. Um, the thing is, what happened, and if we're just really honest, because of what has occurred this last month with the elections and, and really focusing on a country that's absolutely divided, where your neighbor is elated by the results and your other neighbor is terrified by the results, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we hit Ephesians 5, and Ephesians 5 tells us to be imitators of God. Like beloved children, come and be imitators of God. And to do that, you need to walk in the love of Christ. And that just really compelled me to, to stop right there and kind of flesh that out. So in a way, and, and this, this week is no different, we're gonna kind of have a series within a series. Um, today, we're talking about what love does. We've talked about what love is. And before that, we talked about whether we should walk in that love. But this morning, we are gonna talk about what love does. Love makes us do crazy things. And I'm not even talking about that agape Jesus type of love. I'm talking about even that human love. I met my wife at a coffee shop. Love makes you do crazy things because I went to her. I was a newly minted Christian. She had her Bible out. And I was like, ooh, Christian lady who's hot. There you go. And so I walk up to her and I'm like, hey, what's up, girl? And no, I didn't know how you Christians do it. So I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't spit the Christian game. I didn't know I was supposed to invite her to Bible study or something, right? I had no clue that's what you're supposed to do. She had her Bible open. I said, hey, that's a great book. And she's like, uh, yeah, it's the Bible. And so... She excused herself immediately, went downstairs to go to the bathroom, had thoughts of actually running away and leaving her computer and stuff behind because of the creepy guy. But then we started dating and she realized how amazing I am. And so the thing is, uh, she tell all her mentors, all her godly Christian women mentors were like, you need to break up with that fool. Like who, what do you think you're doing? So love makes you do crazy things. Two weeks into dating, I was like, hey, I'll talk to you later. I love you. Two weeks. She was like, thank you. For those who are uh, below the age of 25, this, we used to have phones that did this, not, not this. Just, I don't know if you, okay, yeah. Anyway, love makes us do silly things, right? It makes us do crazy things. Christ's love is really no different. It makes us look different from the world and love does stuff. There's a great book by Bob Goff called Love Does. It. I, 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 I'm stealing that title today, but it has nothing to do with the book. Um, there is a false dichotomy happening in the church and it's a false narrative that is being spun. And if we're not careful, um, we may be bought into it. And that's the idea that we are a come and see faith, not a go and tell faith. Now, look, I think there's room for attractional ministry. I think there's room for an attractional church where you're inviting people to a building. But do you understand that when you leave this building, the church leaves with you and this just becomes a building. It's just brick and mortar. But when you enter into this building as the people of Christ, this becomes the church. You are the church, okay? The church is not bound in brick and mortar. It's bound in flesh and blood and hearts that have been turned to Christ. Okay, but there's a false dichotomy going on, a false narrative saying that, no, no, we're a come and see, not a go and tell. We gotta have these, these spiritual huddles, these holy huddles. And even more so because we're in such a divided country right now that some of the responses of the church is, well, we just need to go over here and we need to, you know, no, let the bad culture, the bad world do what it does. But we're gonna be here on Sunday mornings. We're gonna be quiet. We're gonna be good. And we're gonna be safe. And that is contradictory to the gospel. 
So the narrative is not that we come to these holy huddles, it's that we go and tell people about the hope that we have in Christ. I mean, we just sang about it. Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope, the glory. Our hope is not bound in institutions made by man. It's not bound by elected presidents. It's not bound by elected senators and representatives or forms of government. Our hope is bound in Jesus. And there is a world out there aching to know who he is. If you want the narrative out there of division to be crushed and to be going down and to us to unite under something, it's got to be more than just politics. It's got to be Christ. So we talked about a few weeks ago that, that, that we are to be imitators like beloved children because we are God's kids. He's adopted us through Christ to be his children. And so then we as God's children then go and talk about how we've been adopted and ransomed from our sin. And then we talked about last week in 1 Corinthians 13 that if we do not love, then we are a clanging gong. We're just white noise on the backdrop of culture. We have, hear this, hear this. If you do not love your neighbor as yourself, you have no right to speak into other people's lives. And I would tell this, and this is one of those clear the church statements, okay? Save your email, okay? But if you say, I love God, but do not love people, you have not met my Jesus, all right? So now this week, we're gonna unpack what love does. What does it make us do? Why does it make us do things that seem counter to what the world is telling us we need and what we need to do? We're gonna be in Isaiah chapter 58, you can go ahead and turn there, but before we're there, I gotta get you, I gotta get you there first. So Isaiah 58, we're gonna start in verse six. You can go ahead and open your Bible to that. It will be on the screen, but first of all, let me tell you this. In 1 Peter chapter two, verse 24, Peter says this, he himself, that's Christ, bore, on the, bore in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds, we are healed. So what does love do? Well, Christ's love bore our sins. And now we have this mentality that I think we may have, I don't know, in Sunday school, we, we got taught this with a felt board and every, I, I don't know, but that Christ somehow like bears our sins. Like he's like that, um, you ever see those really cheesy Christian churches like the Lord's gym? Yeah? And like, you got the guy, muscular guy, he's pushing up and there's a cross on his back. Nope, nobody? Is that a Southern thing? Yes, one of you? Fantastic. All you need to know is a really terrible knockoff. So, and, and so we have this idea that Christ, that, that went nowhere. Well, no one doesn't know what you're talking about. So uh, you have this idea that Christ kind of bore our sins. Like you put them on his shoulders or something or his back. Christ became your sin. Christ embodied your sin and my sin. And when he died, our sin died with him, but he rose conquering sin and death once and for all so that by his wounds, the wounds that we inflicted, that our sin inflicts on him, we are healed. So what does, love, what does love do? Love binds up the brokenhearted. It heals people from their wounds of sin. Love allows us to have new life. He himself bore our sins in his body on that tree, on that cross, that we may die to sin and be alive in righteousness. For he who knew no sin became sin, literally enveloped sin, Christ enveloped sin, that we may become the righteousness of God. Now hear me, we are about to go through a lot of things about what love allows us to do, propels us to do. But I'm telling you right now, if you don't get this, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not walking with Christ, if you're not repented, then none of this matters. None of the rest of it matters because you're gonna think it's a pragmatic list of things to do and not do and how to act and you're gonna be following cold dead religion and not Jesus. You've got to get the gospel first. That's got to be the first thing you know, that you are a follower of Christ, that you have repented of your sins, that you trust that Jesus can do what he says he does when he says all your wounds are healed, all your sin is brushed away. And at 2 Corinthians 5, you become that new creation in Christ. You've got to get that or none of this else matters. None of us else matters. I do not want you leaving here going, well, pastor gave us a seven step process of how to be a better person. There is one step process of being a better person that is Jesus Christ. You cannot do good on your own outside of Christ. So if love, that sacrificial love, if it does break, excuse me, bind the wounded heart, brokenhearted and binds up our wounds of sin, Philippians chapter two, verse one through two says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Love doesn't only just heal us from sins and give us new life, it binds us and unifies us. 
Now, here's the thing. We're not looking for identical uh, replication of believers. I'm not trying to form you into the Eastside Baptist Church Christian. Each of you have giftings, you have passions, you have desires, and all those things are not begin and end with you. They are given to you by God in this season, at this time, at this time in history, for you to glorify him in all of your efforts. You take joy in what God has given you because he takes joy in you and creating you for his purpose. So I'm not trying to make you into robots, but we are trying to unify underneath the banner of the gospel and how we do that, of having that same love and being of one mind is the reality that every single person in here, no matter your race, your gender, your economic background, if you're a church kid, you're not a church kid, the fact of the matter is one thing we all have in common in this room today is we are all sinners far from God and we needed a savior to make us back in a relationship with our heavenly father. That's what makes the pauper and the prince exactly the same, is that we all have a need for Christ. So because of that, we can unify under that banner. We can all think, I mean, half the room may have voted for Hillary, half the room voted for Trump. All of us can stand for Christ. It's time to defunct the narrative right now going on in our culture saying the division is too big, too large. Pick your sides. No, we pick the side of Jesus. We will unify underneath that banner because love, the love of Christ, it does heal. That love does unite us. Okay, so that's like 100,000 feet level, right? Let's bring it down to, to ground level. What does that look like for you and I on a daily basis of what love does in our lives and how it pushes us to be in the lives of others? Isaiah chapter 58, verse six. Before we get there, let me tell you, Isaiah is an amazing book, um, Right now, uh, before verse six, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah and they're kind of talk, they're talking about fasting. And I know you and I, uh, when we think about fasting, it's that spiritual discipline, right? Of withholding food or even drink sometimes so that it's just you and God and you can depend on the Lord and you can have those moments and that season with God, however long that's gonna be. You're denying yourselves of earthly things so that you can have complete dependence and that's when you hear from God. And I know what you're thinking. It's been a while since you fasted, pastor. I get that, yeah. But the thing is, when he talks about fast here, that it is talking about the, that, but think more spiritual discipline. Okay, think more of, a, of the spiritual discipline of not just acting like a believer or follower of God, but actually believing that and loving like that. Okay, and so what the people of God, what Israel are saying is like, hey, God, look, in, in these first couple of verses, when God talks about, hey, look, we're sitting here, we're doing everything in your name. We're doing all these things and, and, and we're fasting and we're asking for your presence, but you're not showing up. What gives? That, that's my translation, but it's pretty much like, what gives? You know, what's happening here? We're doing all these things in your name and you're not here. And Isaiah is about to flip the script on him and say, look, here's what God's saying. Not that you just want his presence, you actually have to be his people. You actually have to allow the love of Christ and for them, the love of God and the faithfulness of God and who he is, Yahweh, to resonate in your lives and in your culture, in your homes. So you're just not following a religious sect or principles that you're actually following God. If you want me, you first let me need to, ha I first need to have your heart, okay? So he's talking about this fast and then he begins in Isaiah 58 verse six. He says, is this not the fast that I choose or is this not the spiritual disciplines that I choose? Is this the, not the type of people that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? I'm gonna stop right here and we're just gonna do that a lot today. It's just, it's read a section and stop. That's how it's gonna to go today. You're welcome. Um, I, I actually ended short first sermon. So um, I'm just gonna tack it onto this one. All right. Amen. Okay, you heard them. When you get hungry, you blame the people in the middle. They're the most vocal about it. Okay, so a couple of things here. There could be 10 other pastors that come up here and look at verse six and they'll explain it 10 different ways. And, and, and all of them may be right. What, what I want for us today to see, I see the gospel in this verse. It says, is not this what I choose? It's not the fast I choose. It's not what I choose for my people, the spiritual disciplines I choose for my people. What type of people I need to loose the bonds of wickedness that sin brings into our lives and shackles us? 
Is it not to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not for you to unburden yourself with sin and come to Christ? Is it not to repent of being people who are wicked people? And the thing is, and, and, and I don't think this is even a really big deal to admit anymore, that we are a broken country and culture and world. We just turn on the news and we see that. We look in our hearts and we see that. But I, I really truly believe this. That is, is this not what I choose that you loosen the bonds of wickedness? Here's the thing. You want to know what the biggest division is in our country? It's not Republican versus Democrat. It's sin. The biggest division in our country is that some of us are far from God and we need a mediator that is Christ to come and bring us near. That's the biggest hurdle any of us will ever conquer. That's the biggest obstacle any of us will ever overcome. And the funny thing is we don't do anything to overcome it. It's Christ that does it when we loosen the bonds of wickedness in our life, when we repent and follow Jesus, then we are free. And Paul says, yes, free indeed. Look at Matthew up here on the screen. Matthew chapter uh, 11, verse 20 through 30 says this, Christ is speaking, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we loosen the bonds of wickedness. We exchange the yoke of sin for the yoke of Christ, which is light and means freedom. But here's what's funny about these two verses if you put them side by side. The funny thing is it's not like we are unburdened by sin and then we're free to do whatever we want to. We become not a slave to sin, but a slave to a savior. And he is such a better master than the former. Jesus says, my yoke is easy for you to bear because I bore it for you. Now hear me, please, if you get nothing out this morning and you don't get into any of the practical or applicational points here to come, Know this, some of you came in here still yoked to the slavery of sin, to the bonds of wickedness. And look, we've all been there. Those who are followers of Jesus for just a short time or our entire lives, we have been where you've been. And I am asking you this morning, will you consider Jesus? There is not a coincidence or a chance that you're here this morning hearing this message in this place at this time in this city. God is wanting you so badly to come out of slavery and into a relationship. And if you don't get this, then like I said, none of this matters. One yoke for another. And Isaiah continues. He says in verse seven, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him? And get this, and I want you to underline, if you're an underliner, some of you are underliners, some of you are highlighters, highlight this, not to hide yourself from your own flesh. So a few things here. Is this not what I desire for my people, what love does? Now remember what love does, right? Christ's love frees us, heals us, binds the brokenhearted. It unites us, but then love compels us to do things that are crazy, right? It is to share the bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into our house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. We can't do that if we're constantly in our holy huddles. We can't do that if we only feel comfortable around people that look like us, talk like us, and use the Christianese like we do. And I am, I am so thankful. It's funny that I say this, and I know this doesn't apply to our church because you're amazing at being on mission. You've shown that with your resources, your time, and your volunteering. But hear this. I never want it to be complacency. I never want to grow old that we are on mission for Christ. We can have victory after victory. And I think after time, what I'm fearful of is like, oh yeah, cool. We had another foster parents night out. It was a hundred kids this time. Oh, that was amazing. That's cool. I never want us to grow. I mean, some of the foster parent nights out, workers are like a <laughs> hundred. We can <laughs> See, this is why we have a great staff. They say, calm down, Kyle. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> I never want us to grow weary of doing good. And it's difficult. And it's not that we don't do good to one another, right? It's not that we are not here, the body of Christ, Eastside Baptist Church. Do we not support one another? Do we not help one another? Do we not disciple one another? When, when you cry out for help, how many of you have been in that moment? I mean, we could go do testimony after testimony of people in this building that are a part of this church that said, I couldn't pay rent. I needed to move. I had a divorce. We fought cancer. And the church, this church, this body was there. Amen? I know I've been there. 
I know we have went through valleys in the short time we've been at Eastside and you locked arms with me. So hear me say, we do that well here. And I want us to know that we always do well and going out and be on mission, but never grow complacent, never grow apathetic. And let's just not grow weary of doing good. Look at the last part. It says, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Now you can come off with that and say, well, that means that we shouldn't hide ourselves from our own sin, our fleshly desires. I believe he's saying to hide yourself from other people who are hungry, who are homeless, who are naked. It is so easy for us to turn a blind eye to injustice, but I wanna be a church and I feel like God wants to be a church because love does this. Love creates margins for the marginalized. It gives voices to the voiceless and it gives hope to the hopeless. And I always wanna be a church that is actively producing those things for our community but I don't wanna hide ourselves from our own brokenness and the brokenness that surrounds us. Look, I, I, this can get me in trouble. I'm sorry, I'm gonna apologize to my wife for a minute. I'm about to give an example, I'm sorry. Um, th- there was a season where, where um, in seminary, okay, so I'm like paying to learn more about God and be righteous, right, okay? And I would drive up in Fort Worth, Texas and I, I was gonna be the next whatever, you name the big pastor, you know, whatever. And I would stop and I would be dreaming about my future church and it's gonna be like all these campuses and thousands of people, just ridiculous nonsense. And then I would see someone panhandling or begging on the side of the street and my first reaction, my heart, I mean, this is just me, look, we're just real here. This is just me being transparent, is they need to get a job. I could literally have just walked out of survey of New Testament and learned about Jesus and been driving along beyond, they need to get a job. They're probably gonna use my money for drugs. Because I didn't want, I mean, I was writing their story for them and not even knowing their name. And then a season hit my family where we had to go on welfare because I lost my job. And I don't like talking about it. Probably shouldn't have wrote a book about it, but there it is. And in that season did I realize that those people have names. And I'm not asking us to help everybody we see. We need to use judgment, we need to use discernment, and the Spirit needs to lead. But shall we never write someone else's story for them without even knowing their name? May we not hide ourselves from injustice. May we not hide ourselves from those who because of their race are being discriminated against or for those who come from another country being discriminated against, for those who can't have kids or those who have too many kids. May we never write their story for them or hide our, hide our eyes from the orphan or the widow. May we never hide ourselves from things that God is saying, I have given you the love of Christ, now this is what love does. And I think that's what he's saying. This is what I want from you. I want you to love those who need it the most. Verse eight. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Um, This is one of my favorite verses in this passage. Um, We have this uh, constant theme in the Bible about light versus dark. We even see it play out in media and movies all the time and stories. And, and what, what God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, your light, the light that I have given you, what love does, it, it breaks forth in the darkest of nights. What, become, what comes before the dawn? It's night. And I know some of you feel like it's midnight in your life. I know some of you feel like it can't get any darker right now. But Christ has freed you from the yoke of slavery and there will be a day where your dawn is coming. Your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteous shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. I like this idea. It's funny, he uses rear guard here. That's a military term. If you look in the Hebrew, it's a military term, rear guard. Um, Let me talk about that first before I talk about the righteous going before us. When Cassie and I were first dating and she actually gave me a chance, um, I don't know why I'm taking a lot of application about our dating. Maybe we just need to go on a date more and kind of, yeah. I don't know what it is. Um, You're just so beautiful being all pregnant and stuff with baby number eight. now, if you're a guest, you know how to pray for us. Okay. Um, 
when we were dating, we would be in restaurants. And um, the reason why my parents couldn't understand, why are you going to grad school out of state? Because we'd be in these restaurants and people would come and, and there would be um, old running buddies. You, you all have them, right? Yes? So I'm the only heathen in college? <laughs> May you all repent after this. And they'd come up to me and they'd see Cassie and be like, what's up, Kyle? They're just, you know, my, my kids in here, so I won't tell you what they said. But, they, I mean, they said some crazy stuff. And because um, they knew old me. They didn't know Jesus me. They knew old me. And I would be like, Cassie, I love you. I'm so sorry this happened. And I would hide my face. And, you know, but um, I say that because uh, there usually doesn't go a year where I don't get some message from one of those people back in college going, bro, you're a pastor? It's like the greatest comical joke that God's ever played on humanity, making Kyle Rainey a pastor. I'm like, yeah, man, like, yeah, Jesus did this stuff and, and you know, yeah, it's awesome. And does your church know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and people show up. Yep, they show up every Sunday. Um, some of you have come to know Christ later in life and, um, and, and you have felt that love and you felt compelled to love others and you put yourself out there to love others and the people of your past are slinging slanderous arrows at your back saying there's no way. There's no way they could have be this person now. Hear me. You don't worry about what they say for the Lord will be your rear guard. God's righteousness and his holiness and his adoption of you, he's got your back. He will be your rear guard, defending you from the arrows of the enemy and arrows of the naysayers that says there is no way, but you know there is a way because love does. And then he says, well, and the righteousness of God will go before you meaning that even though your light is breaking forth the dawn, that's the light of Christ and God's righteousness goes before you. So like you're stuck in the middle, protected. God's righteousness out here because all that we do and individually and at this church is to bring glory to God. So his righteousness goes before us. He's got our back and you just get to cruise in the middle. All right? Because that's what love does. God never denies his kids. Verse nine, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking of wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. Now, a a few things here um, and then we're almost done, I promise. When you look at this entirety of this passage, um, don't be confused here when it says, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. As if, if you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, pull yourself out for the poor, if you do all those things, then God's gonna finally hear you. God will finally recognize you. We know that's not true because of a little thing called the Bible. Because all of scripture says, it's not that you work hard and do good things and that God loves you. It's that God loves you completely and wholly through Christ. So then you can go and do good things. You experience the love of Christ and that experience compels you then to go and do what love does. So hear me when I say, when it says you shall call and the Lord will answer, you shall cry and you'll say, here I am. Understand that's after you have met with Jesus and that yoke of sin have been taken off. I mean, look what the exact, the next phrase says, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, if you remove the yoke of sin and go back to the first verse, it's like, if you loosen the bonds of wickedness, if you are my child, if you are loved by me through Jesus completely and holy, then you shall call and I will never not answer. I will hear you for the very first time once you become my kids. You shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and you'll say, here I am. He goes on to say, your, 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 your gloom will be like the noonday. What does that mean? When we experience the fullness and love of Christ, nothing, nothing on this earth will ever dictate our joy and happiness again. We are not bound to human institutions, situations, and outcomes. 
we are bound to the hope of Christ. And in our darkest of days, which will come because we live in a broken world, it'll be like the noonday, the highest point of when the sun's in the sky because we have been loved and that is what love does. Have you ever met someone in a difficult season of life that is a follower of Christ that you admire and yes, they mourn and yes, they weep and maybe they even get angry, but in the end, they come around to the reality and are an example of righteousness and knowing that love has conquered everything and no matter what my tomorrow brings, I have Jesus. That's what love does. And when you cry, you will be heard. Verse 11. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. I, I love how Isaiah kind of pick, paints this picture of like once you are uh, heard from God, you're his kid and the yoke of sin has been removed and that you're walking with him. You're one of his. What love does is it replenishes, it renews in the hurt places, in the scorched places, the places in your history which have been burned by sin and things even outside of your control. God redeems those things. He uses those things and then you for others are like a watered garden, like springs of water whose waters never fail. Uh, I, I, I mean, Jesus says this in John chapter 7, verse 37 through 38. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow what? Living water. Streams of living water flow from those who are been adopted by Christ. That's what love does. Verse 12 and then I'm done. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall rise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which you dwell in. A few things and then we're done. I am staking my family's future and the future of this church on the fact that Christ bore our sins on a cross and by his wounds we are healed. Because that's what love does. Love doesn't have strings attached. Love compels us to do crazy things. Love unites us under the banner of the gospel. Love removes the wickedness from us. Love compels us to then go and love other people and clothe the naked and feed the hungry. Love makes our gloom like the noonday. Love does allow us to then see others as Christ sees them. And in the end, we will be known as repairers of the breach. We will we will uh, rebuild our ancient ruins and they will be rebuilt and we shall raise up the foundations of many generations. That means that's why we do Foster Parents Signed Out. That's why we do Awana. That's why we do Elevate Junior. That's why we do Elevate. That's why we do student ministry because there are gonna be generations that we need to raise up and make them sure that they know not only the love of Christ, but that's what love does and how they are to respond to that love. And as we do that and go forth, we will be repairers of the breach and the streets in which we dwell in because that's what love does. So look, I'm asking, I mean, my elders are gonna hate this. Even if you don't stay at this church and you move on to another season, I pray that you find a church that not only just preaches the gospel, but compels you to understand that we are not just saved from sin, but we are also saved to a mission. And that mission, when we are on mission, that is when we feel the completeness of Christ. Some of us, our entire lives, we go to all these Bible studies, we're in all these Sunday schools, all these small groups, whenever the church doors open, we run to them, okay? But we feel like there's something missing. Well, I'm asking you, if you've been filled with the love of Christ, if you are overwhelmed by the love of Christ, but you are not then compelled to then see what love will do in your lives, in your ministry, in your mission, in your neighborhood, then maybe, just maybe, you're not getting the complete picture of what Christ has done for you. And I'm telling you, you want to find pleasure in walking with God, then see what love will do 
in you. What love did was take a sinner that hated his parents, that was addicted to things that are unspeakable, and he turned him into a son. And years later now, I have the privilege of being that person to come and tell you I am a walking example of what love can do. And if Christ's love can do that for me, it can do it for you, I promise. So may we leave here and we end this season as we walk into Advent and celebrate the coming of the Christ child. May we do it in love. For there are gonna be people in this country that need answers from us. Are you going to act like the apocalypse is happening because so-and-so got elected or so-and-so didn't get elected? Are we going to buy into the false narrative that the division is too great, that we can't overcome it? Or are we going to sit back and see what love can do? May we as a church bound by the love of the gospel come together arm in arm and go out from this place and be the church out there and be and spread and talk about and engage with others who need the love of Christ. The gospel is not just a one-time event and where you met Christ and got introduced to the church. It is a daily thing that we use as a template for our lives and we apply it to our lives, our marriages, our, our parenting, our relationships. That is what love does. And so when people look at Eastside Baptist Church, what I want them to see often is that maybe they don't have the best preacher or worship, or children's ministry, but that church loves. But not the fickle type of human love that ebbs and flow with situations and seasons of life, but that type of agape sacrificial love that can only be stemmed from Christ. In this opportunity and season of Christmas, there is never a better time to see what love can do. I love you. I love that you're here. I love that I'm your pastor. And I know that together we will be overwhelmed when we leave this place and as the years go by to see exactly what the love of Christ can do. Let's pray. Father, We worship now because, well, because your love has done things. And Lord, I pray that you will um, deal with us each individually and corporately as you see fit. And Father, if there is someone here this morning who for the first time their heart is awakened to the reality of their need of Jesus, will you please, Lord, Give them the faith in which they need to believe in Christ. May they find freedom in that. May, we, may they experience the overwhelming love that you have for them by sacrificing your son when they deserve death. And Father, may we respond then by then leaving this place and telling others about the love that we have discovered. For those of us, Father, who have been walking with Christ for a while now, God, may we never silo May we never get bored of doing good. And Father, may we be reminded this morning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that when your love came down and changed everything. That's all this in Jesus' name, amen.